हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन गुड डे फ्रेंड्स आई एम राहुल बगड़िया को फाउंडर एंड डायरेक्टर ऑफ थी मैनी फोल्ड आई वेलकम यू ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर दिस वेरी एक्साइटिंग वेबिनार टुडे वी शेड डिस्कस ई थ्री व्हीलर इकोनॉमिक्स अपॉर्चुनिटीज एंड बिजनेस मॉडल्स इन इंडिया वी हैव टू वेरी एक्सपीरियंस एक्सपर्ट्स विथ अस Goldie Shrivastav he is co-founder and CEO Smarty his company as we are talking runs a 800 plus uh, fleet size of uh, e-rickshaws uh, in Gurgaon area in New Delhi uh, and the company has seen very fast ramp up uh, with going from 100 to 800 rickshaws in less than a year he is currently doing in vehicle charging and have dedicated station our other expert is yuvraj sada he is senior manager strategy at sun mobility his company is one of pioneers to design and execute battery swapping and they have taken the challenge bulls head by making it work with ashok leland in e buses first now they are in phase 2 kind of launch uh their next offering with uh, three wheeler and two wheeler uh with battery swapping model so we bring two very diverse set of speakers and experts one uh smarty which i call as an aggregator who is kind of running and managing a full uh e three wheeler fleet and other sun mobility who is acting as a charging station battery leasing and charging uh, operator so let me kind of give a very quick context to the uh, electric three wheeler market uh, what is the market and how it uh, is in india friends india is the largest three wheeler market globally we have almost 15 million three wheelers operating in india 60% of which are manually run 35% are ic vehicles run either on diesel petrol or cng and less than 5% totaling to some uh, uh 5 lakhs kind of 0.5 million would be e rickshaws and they are mostly run by lead acid batteries today the ridership the ownership of this three wheelers is on higher side owned by individuals almost 60% rest are unorganized uh, fleet operators small size operators rental model and very very little percent is kind of organized in this space so i think there is a tremendous opportunity from going from manual rickshaws to actually e rickshaws and kind of replacing our ic autos with e autos so that's the kind of opportunity we are kind of looking at in india and with growing urbanization uh with a uh, uh, huge and increased focus on public mass transport three wheeler fleet will actually play a very strong role for short distance first mile and last mile from this public uh, mass transports so i think goldie will share more details how across metro stations his company has been able to develop a, a strong operational model uh, i see two confusions friends uh, in much of the industry or at least the uh, little outside industry people between e rickshaws and e autos we are the electric three wheeler today covers both the range one the e rickshaw which kind of gives 25 kilometers per hour speed and e autos which gives higher speed of 45 kilometers per hour so with all current technology uh, india is already producing this two wheelers and we have enough players uh, in the market let's try to understand where how the new lithium ion battery uh, stands versus the existing most prevalent lead acid batteries so i have taken example of e rickshaw here thanks to my good friend zafar from goenka 
uh, who shared uh, this top comparison with me earlier. So here, friends, like you will see a lead acid e-rickshaw would have kind of a four batteries, 12 volts, 100 ampere hour, each weighing almost 30 kgs, total 120 kgs of battery versus lithium ion, which is like 35, 36 kgs of the battery. So huge reduction in the weight, which kind of give advantage in terms of better vehicle efficiency uh, for the vehicle. Second, lead acid by its chemistry, it lasts six to eight months with the kind of duty cycle uh, an e rickshaw runs uh, in a city like Delhi versus lithium ion, which can go to at least four to five years. Lithium ion also allows faster charging. The mileage, uh, the battery degradation and performance of lithium ion kind of remains fairly intact. There is reduction, but I think that would not be higher than six to 10% range compared to lead acid, where in a very short three months of time or four months, you will see that almost 50% of battery capacity has dropped down. So that's why actually a lead acid battery will need a replacement in almost kind of a six months time period. So th those, those are the kind of things that turn into advantage of lithium ion. In terms of the battery price, these are some industry numbers and there could be some variations. A lithium ion would cost almost kind of a two and a half times of lead acid battery, but then it comes with all the above advantages uh, in terms of faster charging, higher life, lesser weight, more revenue time to the vehicle because now you can charge the vehicle faster. So that's where the total cost of ownership of a lead acid battery integrated e-rickshaw comes out to be actually higher than lithium ion. So just in terms of comparison, like for a vehicle life of four years, you would need almost eight times of replacement of a lead acid battery, which will cost you almost 1.9 lakhs money spent in four years time period. So this is almost half in case of lithium ion, where you will need only one replacement in four years. So this change to an advantage point when you compare the total cost of ownership. So I'm showing some numbers when you integrate both the vehicle and battery together in terms of rupees per kilometer and lithium ion, you, as you see, gives an advantage. And if you do purely battery and charging cost as well, then again, the lithium ion, even with high cost of the battery and high initial capex gives you advantage. So I think, this is where the entrepreneurs like Smarty are coming in, taking the service role play and realizing this opportunity and also the advantage. Of course, freeing our climate from the environmental pollution of lead acid battery. So now, what are the other innovations that has happened in interim? So the other advantage, the other system that has come is the swapping battery system. Dr. Ashok Junjunwala, the IIT Madras team and the industry have worked very closely together for more than a year and have been able to develop systems with standardization. Our other speaker, uh, Yuvraj from Sun Mobility, will share more details around the swap battery system. But at a very top level, friends, with swap battery, you actually can reduce the further size of the battery. So here in terms, I'm comparing that a swap, uh, swap battery system, we can have three KWH of the battery capacity. So this will come in terms of two batteries, each of 1.5 KWH size. You get a better life cycle advantage with swap battery because now you are not charging the battery while in the vehicle in heated conditions, but under a controlled atmosphere and that gives a better advantage life of swap battery that actually further brings down its uh, overall TCO cost. 
in terms of time the uh, the uptime of the vehicle swap battery has an advantage because now you can in two minutes you just can uh, two to three minutes you can change your battery and that uptime higher uptime can lead to a better revenue opportunity for our uh, drivers for our owners in terms of the electricity requirements that also reduces with swap battery system so this convert into an advantage friends where here i am showing you some numbers under some assumptions that swappable system comes fairly competitive in fact lower under some assumptions uh, versus the lithium integrated ion battery both for the charging and battery leasing cost and the total vehicle cost so i think swap battery system has emerged as a very good uh alternative technology to our existing options and let's understand what our other two speakers have to say have to discuss in terms of the business models which they see and which they are currently making it happen so with this friends i invite now mr goldie shrivastav from smarty to share his thoughts his experience on smarty and tips for the industry goldie please am i audible uh, yes goldie go ahead all right excellent um just give me one second and rahul if you could also confirm see we can yes. see your screen you can put on the screen mode Okay, uh, I'm just trying to get that done. Give me a second, please. Yeah. Is it come on the full screen mode yet? No. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, Goldie just hit that uh, full screen mode button. Something seems to have gone. All right. Um, Just besides that, uh, either if you can hit the. Uh, Just give me one. Second. Yeah, one sec. So it, for some strange reasons, it just froze. <laughs> I can see the. Give me one second, uh, Rahul. I think there's a bit of a glitch at my end. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Sure, sure, no worries. I was expected things go wrong when you want them to work. I can close. Let's do one thing that while you need some time, uh, should we go ahead with uh, having the? Uh, I think we've got it all now. So, yeah, all right. Okay. Is yeah, that is good. Excellent. Uh, so, hi, afternoon, friends. Uh, on this, um, on this, uh, you know, uh, the conference. Uh, my name is Goldie Shivasthwa. So, thank you, Rahul, once again for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, much honored and appreciate the. Uh, the invitation. Um, my name is Goldie Shivastva. I am the co-founder and uh, chief executive officer for Smarty. Uh, Smarty today is uh, India's largest uh, and also the first um, electric vehicle operator specifically serving the last mile uh, space. As Rahul uh, earlier introduced, uh, you know, uh, you know, we are close to a thousand vehicle fleet now uh, operational in Delhi and CR and setting sites for larger expansion across the country. Uh, essentially, over the next uh, you know 15-20 minutes or so, I would uh, uh, spend time with you, uh, touching about three aspects uh, through my presentation. When first and foremost, uh, would lay out 
uh, you know the, the genesis of smarty and what's the what's the vision that we have set out to achieve um, the second piece would be certain uh, sort of uh, you know operational highlights that you may find very interesting because as a company we have generally shied away from a lot of press coverage we, we believe in doing a lot of work but uh, i think uh, amongst um, you know colleagues and peers like you on the on this uh, on this webinar I would love to share some of the performance highlights and then uh, we'll spend a good part of my time talking about the different building blocks um, that we as an aggregator and an operator uh, have put in place over last uh, nearly three years of our operation and talk to you about where we are, uh, what are the challenges that we see and where we think uh, we have a long um, you know, sort of opportunity or we have long way to go in terms of uh, both getting the uh, getting the ecosystem right and getting the supply chain right so there are some unique insights that uh, you know would love to share with you given uh, again we are one of those rare companies which are operating electric vehicles at this scale currently in the country so uh, jumping straight on into the presentation uh, you know uh, the cover slide what you see is a slide it's one of my favorite slides um, you know uh, of uh, our vehicles queued up it's a it's a fairly old uh, image but is is very sort of symptomatic of the the, the experience you're trying to deliver and essentially at a uh, large number of metro stations we are uh, you know sort of creating a very reliable safe secure and economical last mile connectivity service using our fleet of electric three wheelers uh, moving on uh, you know that really is our sort of the, the vision the five year vision as we laid out uh, sometime last year and the vision was that within the next five years, they want to create not just India's but also world's largest electric mobility system. Uh, you know, and underneath that, uh, you know, we are guided by some of the larger objectives, uh, which are not really financial in nature. Those objectives are really around creating, um, a, you know, a base of over 100,000 meaningful jobs or livelihoods, uh, be able to you know create adequate um you know carbon emission reduction that's equivalent of planting about 17 million trees and in in, in process essentially deliver uh, safe rides to over 4 billion people a year uh, now to to a lot of you you may you may sort of uh, scoff at these numbers that you know they are pretty large uh, but you know historically if you look at it uh, you know, in, 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 even within at a very short scale and a very short span of time, we have delivered close to 20 million rides till date, right, uh, with a very small fleet. So we are pretty confident that as we expand our fleet uh, exponentially in the coming four years across the country, you know, we will be able to deliver the kind of impacts uh, that we are hoping for. And uh, to do that, obviously, we will need a lot of partners, including many of uh, those who are on this uh, webinar as well. Uh, what is the impact that we're looking to create? As I said, uh, you know, is that in five years from now, essentially, you know, we want to create uh, an ecosystem that is uh, really uh, taking care of the environmental aspects due to electric mobility, but also in terms of impacting the 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 the, the volume of people that we move. Right uh, today, if you look around the world, um, Beijing Metro is the single largest transport system around the world which delivers about three and a half billion rides some of this data is old so pardon me for that uber for example i believe it delivers closer to a billion rides a year uh, it was half a billion ride about a year ago and ola does about maybe half a billion ride also right uh, and, and for us the idea is how do you create an electric mobility system that delivers far greater number of rides uh, while contributing positively to the environment right so that's uh, really the uh, the large vision that we have uh, you know over the next few years uh, you know, uh, just one, you know, a lot of people ask us, what are we? Are we a vehicle supplier? Are we a, uh, you know, vehicle distributor? What are we? And, and uh, the way we answer that is that Smarty is fundamentally a pure shared electric mobility service provider, right? Which means we use electric vehicles of different form factors to provide shared mobility, uh, you know, wherever the use cases allow us to do. And then we do that through a variety of things, including using vehicles that are made in India, using uh, you know, a lot of technology using a lot of sensors, and we can go in detail in, in those uh, at, at some other time. But we use a lot of technology, both in house and outsourced, right, to provide a very, very unique last mile connectivity solution in a in a shared fashion. Uh, 
you know, from a journey perspective, uh, you know, we started off the genesis is that you know we incorporated as a company back in 2014 when electric was not a sexy word. Uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people. In fact, there wasn't there wasn't much of policy around electric vehicles. There was no clean subsidy, uh, and there were a lot of things that were not there, right? That are there today. That's when we started off. We launched our first fleet of vehicles in October 2015 with 30 vehicles, and then from there on, we have grown strength to strength, right? Um, you know, capturing a lot of demands. Uh, you know, whether it's retired with Haryana government, Delhi government, and a few other state governments. But we've also created a lot of interesting business models that we speak about. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as uh, Rahul earlier introduced, uh, you know, Sun Mobility, one of the other close partners that we work with. You know, uh, we worked with another energy partner of more than two years ago to create a energy as a service model, right? When uh, you know the entire industry only knew how to sell batteries, we worked with uh, Amara Raja, which is India's second largest battery maker, to create an energy as a service model. So we take a lot of pride in doing some very very interesting things. Uh, over the years, uh, you know, next few slides, uh, you know, so that's a larger sort of context. Next few slides will give you a sense of how we have grown over the years. Uh, as I said, you know, we started from a fleet of, you know, just about 30 vehicles in October 2015, and uh, towards the end of April, May uh, 2018, we were, you know, over uh, sort of close to sort of uh, 900 vehicles, right? So that's that's a growth that we have seen, uh, almost 30x in 30 months. Um, you know, similarly, our ridership uh, has uh, seen a, you know very, very significant change uh, and uptick over the years. I mean, today we do on an average of 60,000 plus rides, uh, you know, on a daily basis, right? Uh, you know, which is literally, uh, you know, providing our services to more than 60,000 people. And over a period of time, we believe that this number will continue to exponentially grow. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, just to give you a snapshot, uh, given that uh, we operate significantly in Delhi NCR, we have also seen significant uptake for services like these across all the key metro stations. And these are just some sample metro stations for your reference. Two in uh, Gurgaon, one in Faridabad. Uh, we currently operate out of 14 metro stations between Delhi and CR, and then we're adding more and more stations as we speak. But again, a significant uptake from a ridership and customer preference for our platform, uh, you know, over the years. Uh, and and so so and while staying on the ridership and while we are you know we are seeing an uptake. The point that I want to make here is that we are still only capturing maybe less than 10% of the market that is out there, right? And so what it will tell you is that in Gurgaon, for example, if uh, uh, there is a, a metro station which is like the Huda city center, you know, which has a daily footfall of about one and a half lakh people, maybe we are only addressing about 15,000 people as of day to day, right? So there's a huge opportunity that is still exists, especially for electric three wheelers to capture the remainder of the opportunity that's out there. Uh, because uh, more and more governments are becoming keen, more and more metro systems are becoming keen that the last mile has to be really, really uh, eco-friendly, safe, reliable, and economical. And that can only be done, I believe, through, uh, through electric three wheelers. Uh, over the next few slides, I will talk about what are the different parts of the uh, uh, puzzle that uh, you know one would need, or at least for players like us, we had to, to solve for, right? And there are about six or seven elements of what we call uh, the code, right? That uh, we, one needs to get right to create a full ecosystem of an electric three-wheeler uh, piece, right? It starts from the vehicle itself, which is, you know, does one have very strong OEM partnerships? Uh, for us, uh, we've been fortunate to work with uh, some of the leading players in this space. So we started with going electric motors, uh, then we diversified to, you know, to, to uh, induct vehicles from kinetic green, uh, we are working very closely with Mahindra, also Lohia Motors, right? So we're working with all of these uh, leaders in the industry, right, to create uh, not just to buy vehicles, but also to advise them as to what should a good electric three-wheeler vehicle look like. Fact of the matter is that as a, as a company, we are perhaps the only ones that have a significant on-ground experience of what are the different things that goes wrong, right? And we are able to sort of uh, provide that insight to the OEMs on a proactive basis, which in turn helps them build better vehicles as we go on. Uh, because you know, as a business model, right, we operate in a hub and spoke model, uh, wherein we create large charging infrastructures of uh, that, that can charge and park about 150 to 200 vehicles. And thereby we are able to provide insights on ground to the OEMs to tell them as to what is working, what is not working. And that's an insight that 
uh, I think a lot of these OEMs rely on us heavily to uh, to improvise their platforms on. So this is something that uh, we take a lot of pride in, and in having created a very robust set of partners that we work closely with to deploy these vehicles. The next piece is on the design, right? Now, you know, uh, you know, India is an aspirational country, right? It is also a very young country, and as a country, we are exposed to what's happening around the world. Unfortunately, if you look at the traditional three-wheeler market, you will realize that for last 50, 60 years, the vehicle design has been pretty much the same. Right? It's the same looking vehicle. It's you know, it's maybe incremental changes over the year uh, because the customer experience was not something that a uh, lot of thought was given into from a traditional three-wheeler market. As we move to electric, I think there is also an aspirational need to ensure that the vehicles look and feel great. They should feel world-class. And which is a journey that we have also been working on, you know, both along with our OEM partners, but also with a lot of automotive design firms to see how does a new smart electric vehicle should look like, right? So what you see here, uh, you know, on the extreme left are these set of first vehicles that we lifted into our fleet. And then how we gradually modified, right, uh, working with the OEM studio types and designs of vehicles. And the aspiration is to move completely, keep pushing the boundaries to, to go towards the extreme right, right? How do you create, how do you put vehicles on road uh, that are symbolic of India being a world power, India being uh, truly a, a modern and a smart country, right? So the ethos of the vehicle design is going to play a very, very critical role. And that's something that we're investing heavily in. Uh, the third piece is really around the demand side, right? In terms of, okay, fine, you've got a great platform, you've got a good design. How do you aggregate the demand? And I think this is where perhaps, uh, you know, we, we have our single biggest strength. Uh, wherein we have gone ahead and done contracts and MOUs and uh, legal binding uh, agreements, right, to deploy vehicles across the country. And, and, and some of the notables, one are in the state of Haryana, wherein, uh, you know, we today have the preferred rights to about 5,000 vehicles across the state. We have done about only 20% of it. Uh, Delhi Metro, we are the preferred last mile partners for the entire Delhi Metro network. Uh, and that's something that we are doing. Uh, you know, similarly with Rapid Metro in Gurgaon, with Andhra Pradesh government, with UP government, and a few other states as well. Uh, and the idea is to really create an aggregate demand at the source, especially metro networks and large industrial parks, uh, which is where the last mile connectivity is perhaps uh, you know a big challenge. And uh, that's something that we have uh, you know proudly done. And today, you know, very glad to share that we have a captive aggregated demand of over 20,000 vehicle deployment, right? Which is something that we are currently working to execute against. Uh, in the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, next big piece is on the energy piece, and Rahul spent some time talking about the uh, difference between uh, lead acid and lithium ion. Uh, you know, when we look at that conversation around lead, lead acid and lithium ion, we, we couldn't help but give a huge smile because when we started off, honestly, no one knew. The only usage that people were generally aware of lithium ion was in mobile phones. Um, you know, and it, it uh, gladdens my heart to see how the industry has evolved to newer battery technologies. And, and not just lithium ion, in fact, we are already working uh, with players and partners not named on this for confidential reasons, who are looking at other types of advanced battery uh, chemistries, including supercapacitors, right? So we believe uh, the, the energy piece is something that will have a, will play a pivotal role in transforming this industry. Uh, we are excited because today we have partnerships uh, with uh, pretty much all the leading players in this space, starting from Amron, which has been a very, very old two-year-old strategic partner for us, Sun Mobility. You know, Yuvraj is already here, and he will talk about his offering. We work very closely with Sun and Chetan and his team. Um, you know, Exicom, which is another leading, uh, actually, it is the largest lithium-ion battery maker in the country from an installed base perspective. Uh, also, with two large PSUs like Power Grid Corporation and NTPC, who also have a similar mandate from Government of India to roll out. Um, you know, battery charging and uh, related infrastructure, right? So we're working with all the leading players, uh, you know, from an energy partnership perspective. As I said, when we started off two years ago, uh, companies only knew how to sell batteries. Uh, we worked with them, we pushed them hard uh, to create an energy service model. And uh, increasingly, what we believe that uh, from, a, from a battery perspective, it will become a utility wherein you will pay as you go. And uh, we believe a uh, lot of, uh, you know, I think transformation is, is expected to come our way. Uh, you know, till about uh, four months ago, 100% uh, of a fleet was on lead acid batteries. Uh, I'm happy to share that as it stands today, uh, nearly 15% of the fleet is now moved on to lithium ion. Uh, and in the next six to eight months, uh, you know, we believe more than 75% of our fleet 
uh, you know, will move to lithium and battery as a preferred uh, sort of battery platform. Uh, and for the reasons that Rahul already mentioned, I think lithium and batteries are not just uh, from a you know efficient from a total cost of ownership. They are much lighter. They are quicker to charge. Um, they have an intelligent system sitting on top of it, which is a BMS. And Sun Mobility is doing some very incredible work in terms of just looking at the analytics and uh, you know sort of big data kind of an application on, on these batteries. So there's a lot more that you can do with lithium and batteries, and that's uh, you know an area where Smarty as a company is also putting huge bets on uh, you know in terms of um, you know ensuring that it, our fleet becomes 100% lithium man uh, in the times to come and i think uh, this is one space where i, I believe uh, honestly believe a uh, lot of transformation a lot of new business models and new companies and new technologies will, will, will emerge in the coming years uh, which only helps us as a company because then we don't have to worry about the energy piece so much because then there are reliable partners who will take care of it so that's an energy uh, sort of partnership piece um, you know, uh, you mentioned about charging infrastructure. Now, often in electric vehicles, the biggest uh, pain point that you know people, including skeptics and critics, cite is the lack of adequate charging infrastructure. Uh, we were faced with a similar challenge when we started uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, it was a chicken and egg story. Therein, you know, uh, whether do we wait for someone to build the charging infrastructure for us before we launch our business, or do we do it on our own? And we took the uh, the, the, the harder path of building. Our own infrastructure. So today, not only are they the largest uh, electric three-wheeler company in the country, we are also the largest network of electric uh, vehicle charging stations. You know, we have close to a capacity of close to 800 vehicles uh, that can be charged concurrently. You know, across uh, 50,000 square feet of space. Again, predominantly Delhi and and we're building more of it. We have four of these. We're building two more. Uh, you know, and what it allows us to do is that it, it helps us take away the whole the anxiety of these charging infrastructure. And as I mentioned, uh, most of our vehicles operate in a hub and spoke model. Uh, so each of our vehicles really are within, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I would say three or a four or maximum five kilometer distance from each of our hubs, which means it allows them to, you know, charge their batteries, uh, you know, much more frequently and, and get things done. Uh, what we've also done is that we have created, uh, you know, co-branded, um, uh, you know, repair stations so that, uh, you know, not only uh, do we allow the vehicles to charge and park, but also if something were to go wrong with these vehicles, uh, you know, uh, the, the co-located workshops can also fix those vehicles uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So, but here again, I think, uh, you know, we believe that uh, it's a space that uh, more and more players will come, uh, who will offer charging infrastructure as a service, and uh, at this point of time, Smarty would love to partner with those and build up, uh, you know, build up at scale basis those charging infrastructure. Uh, the next piece is the vehicle financing piece. Perhaps one of the single biggest pain point for this industry is that, and especially electric three wheelers, it's not a very well established asset class, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I still remember that it took us more than eight months of running pillar to post of every single public sector and private sector bank to get loan finance for even 50 vehicles back in 2004. Uh, today things are much better. I think the private sector banks have taken a lead and they are more open to finance the vehicles. Uh, we have ourselves types with banks like Kota, SDFC, General Lakshmi, State Bank of India. Uh, but I think still a lot more work needs to be done here from a policy perspective. And we are working closely with Niti Aayog and with the finance ministry to see how uh, lending for electric three-wheelers can be given either an infrastructure uh, you know, tag or a priority sector lending tag. Uh, with the intent that uh, you know the vehicle should be available at easily financing uh, conditions, right? And, uh, unlike the current uh, environment that exists, so it's something that um, uh, you know we are working towards. And I mean, we want to get to a place where it is very convenient for any individual drivers also to start financing his uh, own vehicle. Uh, currently, a lot of our vehicles are owned by the company. Uh, that's primarily because the banks are not willing to finance too many individual owners. Uh, but we hope that uh, with change in time, that that landscape will also significantly change. Uh, next piece is technology, and I'll, I'll take a couple of minutes here. This is where I think uh, you know we differentiate ourselves against the traditional fleet operators, which is uh, you know uh, as a company we invest a lot in technology, we deploy a lot of technology, uh, not just at a vehicle level, uh, but also from a consumer-facing level. So today, for example, our consumers have the uh, the flexibility of booking our vehicles via an app, paying. Uh, for our vehicle uh, again through an app, uh, you know, uh, our ability to get vehicles to talk to each other, uh, 
uh, you know, using connected vehicle platform, wherein you know a vehicle can actually send signals to the other vehicles to tell you know its um, you know fill rate, uh, how many seats it has occupied, your speed, and so on and so forth. So they're essentially you know investing a lot in building a connected vehicle platform, uh, and then there are things like AI and machine learning that we uh, intend to uh, sort of uh, you know apply to do a lot of predictive demand analysis, right? Uh, so there's a lot of technology pieces uh, that uh, as a company we're working on it's a piece that we believe again it's keeping in mind the aspirations of consumers that today people are so accustomed to paying via smartphones booking via smartphones you know then we have to give customers those choices even for a pretty traditional industry like a three-wheeler uh, you know you know i think uh, you know there's a piece around drivers uh, just put in there which perhaps in my mind is the single biggest challenge for this industry uh, given the nature of uh, the, the, the workforce that exists, uh, which is highly migratory in nature, highly seasonal in nature, very low financial literacy, uh, you know, and highly price sensitive. Uh, as a company, I think we have taken it upon ourselves to uh, try and address some of those issues uh, by providing better training to the drivers, uh, by providing better value proposition, uh, including uh, social welfare schemes and so on. And the idea is to really get um, this segment really uh, take up the electric mobility as a as a big trade, right? Uh, from a job and a livelihood perspective, um, you know, I can tell you for the drivers that uh, drive with us, uh, compared to the traditional uh, three wheelers, they make more than 50 to 60 percent uh, from what they were earning before. Uh, and and we have generally seen uh, and tried and tested and verified from a large number of drivers that a good working driver who spends about 10 hours a day and drives the vehicle for about 100 kilometers ends up making about 18 to 20,000 rupees a month uh, on an average. So it's a huge uh, livelihood and a, you know, earning potential that exists for the drivers, but it's a, also a, a very significant um, challenge area just given the nature of the workforce that exists there, but something that we are looking to uh, solve as we go ahead. Uh, I think this is a slide that uh, you know, sort of Rahul also perhaps touched upon in terms of the overall opportunity. Uh, this is something that where we get extremely excited about. Uh, looking at it because uh, and we have done some significant uh, background work on this. The way we look at it is by 2022, uh, you know, the whole electric three-wheeler space is, in, in our view, about a 71 billion dollar opportunity for a passenger revenue, right? Uh, you know, and and how we calculate it, it's, 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 it's the, the maths is provided there, but pretty much I will touch upon those numbers. You have about half, uh, you have about five million three-wheelers today, about another 10 million cycle rickshaws, and about half a million electric rickshaws, right? And uh, all of these will sort of congregate towards becoming what we call as the whole electric three-wheeler space in the years to come. And once that transformation happens, you are essentially talking about uh, a $70 billion plus opportunity from a passenger revenue perspective, right? Uh, you know, now, uh, and which is why I said that, you know, what we are as a company, what we are currently touching today is less than 10% in a very, very small area in the entire country, right? So there's a huge opportunity for a lot of players like like Smarty to enter into the space and 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 and, and make um, good significant impact, right? Uh, this is how our scale up looks like. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of where we are, I think we we had hoped to close FY18 at around thousand acres. We had, I mean, we did get to about thousand, but essentially over the next few years we want to uh, get to about uh, you know uh, about 150,000 odd vehicles by 2022. Uh, you know, uh, is something that we want to build. And as I said, you know, at which point of time we want to ensure that we are impacting a significant number of drivers from a jobs and livelihood perspective, but also to deliver safe and economic rights to, you know, millions and millions of commuters every day, right? Um, this is sort of uh, the final slide that we have that, um, you know, it's a triple bottom line approach that we as a company we take. For us, there are three very important stakeholders. Uh, one are the drivers themselves, uh, you know, the pilots. Second are commuters and third is government. And uh, we ensure that uh, in whatever we do, whether it's in terms of business model and technology and what have you, we are able to deliver tangible value to each of our stakeholders, right? Uh, drivers get to make more money. It's a very hassle-free existence for the drivers. Uh, you know, for commuters, it's a cheap ride, shared ride. Most of our rides will be surprised to know, actually 98% of our rides are a 10 rupee ride. Uh, so it's a very, very cheap, uh, sort of uh, ride pricing that we offer to our commuters for short distances, something that excites them. 
Uh, it's also a safe ride because each of these vehicles are fitted with GPS sensors and multitude of, uh, you know, with remote tracking, uh, re real-time remote tracking and everything. So commuters get an assurance of a safe last mile connectivity. And ultimately, the government is able to sort of uh, meet some of its policy initiatives, whether it is around, um, you know, the, the push on the electric vehicles or whether it is uh, digital India or, or smart cities initiatives, right? So, so we work towards, uh, you know, achieving uh, some of the key priorities for each of our stakeholder group. And uh, happy to sort of share that uh, I think we've made some decent success in the last uh, you know, the last couple of years uh, so with that uh, you know those are my coordinates and my co-founders coordinates uh, you know um, I'll leave that slide on but uh, you know do drop in a note to me um, reach out to me or visit our website and let us know how the thing we could partner what can we do together and how we can all grow this industry better right uh, the, the point that I'd like to make is that for nearly 60 years, the electric three-wheeler market in the, or the, rather the three-wheeler market in the country has remained pretty much the same. Uh, I think for a young country like India, I think it's upon us to dramatically transform it in the years to come. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you listening to me patiently. And I would like to now hand it over to Rahul for further uh, uh, sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Goldie. I really like when you say that uh, you are taking it to a uh, from the design perspective to a new level and really creating experiences. I think that is definitely a differentiator, and I think as India, we should keep that on uh, uh, high radar as well. In many times, in terms of uh, bringing uh, cost and value. Uh, in terms to kind of uh, compromise on the aesthetics and the quality and the uh, uh, aspirational aspects of it. So I'm sure ki, uh, that is definitely acting as an advantage for Smarty. Uh, so now with this, uh, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Yuvraj uh, Sada from uh, Sun Mobility to share uh, his presentation and uh, 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 share more around uh, what's happening at Sun Mobility around battery swapping model with uh, e uh, Yuvraj. Yeah, th thank you, Rahul. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you and the P Manifold team for organizing this uh, webinar. I hope uh, you know this. Uh, with this webinar, uh, a lot of people in this space uh, understand what's happening around and. They all come together, contribute, and I would like to contribute from my end as well uh, with all the insights and uh, understanding that we have about this market. And I must congratulate uh, Goldie and uh, Smarty team for uh, coming such a long way, uh, you know, in such short period of time in this space, especially which is very unorganized, and uh, you know, taking this uh, ambitious, uh, you know, ambitious task of organizing this market and creating a new era of transportation. So uh, we are always um, happy to participate and uh, you know partner with uh, companies like Smarty and uh, help them enable uh, them to achieve their dream. And uh, that's that's where I will go through some of these points uh, later in my presentation. Let me just uh, you know open up my presentation here and uh, share it with everyone. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes, you, Raj. Great. Okay. So uh, here uh, in my presentation, I would like to share a perspective of uh, charging infrastructure provider and uh, also some insights on the user behavior uh, uh, with respect to charging and uh, uh, some of the operational and uh, cost economics uh, comparison that I would like to bring about. So let me just uh, directly jump onto it and start with uh, three wheelers as you know the context has already been set by both Rahul and uh, uh, Goldie on what this uh, market is all about. India as we know it's the largest three wheeler industry and primarily we have uh, two types nowadays. Uh, one is an auto rickshaw and another is an e rickshaw. Both are being sold uh, at uh, close to you know, 500,000 and 250,000 e-rickshaws uh, every year. Well, e-rickshaws numbers are, uh, you know, nobody has the right number. This is just the right estimate what we believe is. When it comes to operating pattern, uh, you know, given 
three wheelers are mostly used for short distance commute the average distance per trip is usually less than 5 km when it comes to uh, you know and uh, routes pattern and stuff it's highly unorganized while fares are mostly regulated but they are not enforced so that is the reason why we have seen an advent of you know olas and ubers where people have 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 complained about haggling you know uh, on the fares with an auto rickshaw driver so uh, i would say there are regulated fares uh, specified by every city for uh, all the auto rickshaws but they are not enforced when it comes to e rickshaws uh, given that market right now is still very unregulated uh, the fares are uh, you know also there is no specified fare for them and uh, they are called the backbone for supporting the mass transit systems you know the buses the metro trains the local trains uh, this, the people coming from these stations are uh, use these vehicles for their first and last mile connectivity they go to their office they go to their uh, also uh, you know they go to their homes etc when it comes to the ownership pattern of of these vehicles uh, i have mixed both the e rickshaw segment and the auto rickshaw segment and and what we believe uh, is uh, more than 60% of the three wheelers are owned by individual driver come owner well there's also a fairly large segment which is which is not uh, you know very much visible and not not into the news but this around 32 35 or 35 to 37% are owned by unorganized fleet owners uh, you know they offer they buy 5 to 10 auto rickshaws or 5 to 10 e rickshaws and offer them on rent or offer them on a on a lease basis and some of these are unorganized some of these are uh, organized but there's fairly a big pattern of of these uh, smaller operator and uh, then there's 3 to 5% of three wheelers uh, you know are owned by organized fleet operators uh, you know one of them is smarty of course and uh, there are some smaller players who operate or who have their own captive fleet of Uh, cargo uh, vehicles, uh, cargo three wheelers. So that that's how the operating, that's how the ownership pattern of these vehicles is. Now, when it comes to comparison of this segment with Visavi, you know the app-based fleet, uh, taxi fleet, uh, we've just tried to put in some points here. When it comes to auto rickshaw, uh, you know the permits are politically controlled. the auto rickshaws are highly regulated they have certain zones in the city they have a dress code to follow uh, you know the vehicle platform is uh, specified whereas when it comes to app based taxis uh, you know they mostly use an all india permit and they are free to choose what vehicle they they want to run uh, there are no permits around it when it comes to fare so auto rickshaw fares are regulated as i said earlier but they are not enforced whereas fares for these app based taxis the olas and ubers uh, is nowadays totally controlled by these giants uh, and mostly it is uh, on the demand base so there is a surcharge at the time when there is higher demand and even there is a uh, there is a discount when uh, the demand is low when it comes to e rickshaws again uh, e rickshaws right now are unregulated at most of these cities now cities and rtos have started taking uh, uh uh started taking an initiative to organize this thing make it more regulated there are norms and that have started to come in the e rickshaws have now required registration uh, but still when it comes to permit caps so there's no not a permit cap for example uh, in state of uh, karnataka recently there was a release of 30000 permits for auto rickshaws right so there is no such release of permits by states or city authorities for e rickshaws in, in certain cities like kolkata where they have permits based on routes uh so that's how uh, you know e rickshaws are right now and again fares fares are also unregulated because they run on both the models the contract carriage model as well as the stage carriage model where uh, you know they share a number of people share uh, the uh, single vehicle and they split the fare in uh, either 10s or 20s 
that's how the fares are uh, so that that's how they are you know they, so this this entire segment the three wheeler segment is is very different from these app based taxi fees like ola and uber and hence it requires a very very different approach when it comes to electrification so we'll go into that uh, uh, later as well when it comes to now i'm talking uh, about overall three wheeler auto rickshaw market landscape if you look at the overall domestic scale uh, domestic sales uh, it this market has been more or less stagnant uh, over the last few years and uh, primarily because on the passenger side uh, you know there is regulation the permits every year are uh, are politically driven and hence there is lack of uh, certainty around the growth when it comes to uh, the cargo market yes of course uh, cargo market has been um, unregulated in terms of permits but there is a growth of uh, uh, basically the four wheelers right the micro trucks which have now started eroding into the market in fact they have been for here for quite some time now and they have eroded a lot of market share from these cargo three wheeler vehicles well uh, when it comes to uh, kegar so for the last 10 years passenger market has shown a kegar of 5% and shown a marginal growth when it comes to uh, you know oems market share so bajaj is the market leader in terms of sales of these vehicles um, followed by piaggio and uh, mahindra mahindra and mahindra and they have there are some more players uh, who have smaller market share in this segment and uh, they are mostly regional players uh, whereas bajaj piaggio they dominate uh, all the major markets across the country and um, when it comes to the growth uh, estimate uh, we see uh, both diesel and petrol uh, cng and lpg drive trains uh, are expected to uh, grow significantly in fact diesel nowadays because of regulations and preferences of uh, city authorities is seeing some kind of a downturn and uh, also the cost economics is proving out to be slightly more difficult that is why the the focus of this market is now shifting towards cng lpg and uh, you know even electrics when it comes to electrification of an e auto uh, or i was very very uh, specific about auto rickshaw i'm not considering e rickshaw in this so when it comes to electric auto some of the drivers that are going to uh, you know drive the electrification of this segment is that uh, cities now have uh, are considering pollution as a big menace and uh, they are expecting that shifting buses and auto rickshaws to electric may help them reduce some of the urban pollution and uh, when it comes to auto rickshaws uh, you know uh, the permit given government is looking at offering permit free regime for electrics may be another driver that may go um, that may cause electric autos to take off significantly another factor that is there uh, when it comes to electrification is the bharat 6 standard which is which is expected to get uh, you know rolled out uh, 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 in end of or in 2020 2028 so at that time uh, how uh, basically the uh, cost of diesel power train is going to change and uh, that might reduce the gap between an ic engine based on diesel and an electric drive train hence uh, you know that that is another uh, opportunity for um, that might drive the electrification of uh, auto auto rickshaws when it comes to uh, consumer cost effect uh, you know economics uh, consumers are indifferent uh, you know as they as uh, as far as the vehicle drive train is concerned they would want uh, both the user as well as the end uh, you know the driver would want cost to be either uh, reduced or should be similar so that they can do uh, they can adopt this technology and with the current challenges that are there uh, you know refueling is considered inconvenient uh, the way 
charging is has been happening and that is also restricting some of the usage uh, of of these vehicles also uh, you know given uh, these this market has a strong influence from auto unions uh, you know they are expected to pose some resistance uh, and try uh, you know basically uh, given it's a new technology and it has challenges so that that might be another concern when it comes to the three wheeler uh, e rickshaw market landscape uh, we believe uh, total number of e rickshaws on road are anywhere between 0.5 to 0.7 million uh, so so far uh, well, there's no organized number anywhere, but this is just a, an estimate that we believe that, that we have got from some of the credible sources. Monthly sales are in the range of 40 to 50,000. And um, when it comes to registration, as I said, that most of it is unregistered. And now only states have states and cities have started registering them. Uh, you know, the, so there are around 16% of them would be registered. So there's no doubt. Prominent player. Most of these e-rickshaws initially started, um, you know, as as they they were imported as kits from China, and there were uh, small shops and local uh, automotive dealers would want to uh, assemble the kits and sell it, uh, given there is no regulation around it. And uh, in terms of the geographic spread, so moves, you know, the entire Gangetic Belt um, has seen a lot of uh, unemployment and uh, you know and also there there used to be a lot of audience a lot of users of regular regular cycle rickshaw who have now upgraded to an electric auto rickshaw so when it comes to state by state wise distribution of e rickshaws ncr has the largest base of e rickshaws and um, followed by uttar pradesh and west bengal and uh, other states like Bihar and uh, Maharashtra have a small quantity of e-rickshaws. Uh, where this is our estimate of what are the number of vehicles that are registered versus what are unregistered. When it comes to ownership and operations, so uh, when it comes to you know this, most of these e-rickshaws right now are actually owned by these micro entrepreneurs who have you know one or two or five to ten e-rickshaws and they offer it on rent to individual driver come owners 60 percent we believe uh, is 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 that market 40 percent is uh, you know i mean i would say 39 or 40 percent is 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 the market where an individual owns the e-rickshaw and there's a very very small and emerging market which in which we believe uh, you know smarty and other players are who are trying to organize this this market uh, where there, there's an organized fleet which is now, right now own, owning and operating an e-rickshaw. When it comes to challenges, uh, obviously, uh, you know, city like Bangalore has not offered, uh, you know, they are not allowing e-rickshaws into city limits given uh, their low speed. E-rickshaws will have certain challenges in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of presence in certain cities, faces the the regulation. Also, because charging is unorganized, uh, you know there are no regulation. So uh, RTOs are uh, trying to create some strict rules around the usage and uh, you know driving pattern of e-rickshaw. When it comes to you know uh, cost, given this, most of this audience is the audience which have graduated from cycle rickshaw to e-rickshaw market is extremely price sensitive and quality sometimes you know gets neglected uh, in, in that case and hence that's why we see a lot of kits which are uh, not up to the uh, you know oem quality kit um, are being used uh, in this market uh, and and education is another factor how men, not many people are aware about what is the right technology they should choose Another challenge is, is charging. You know, uh, most of these e-rickshaws they they charge either through some illegal means or uh, you know they try and tap on to government electricity lines or they use free charging from their homes. Uh, and usually, some of these uh, uh, you know these 
some of these users actually stay in houses which have BPL connections where uh, you know electricity is literally free. So uh, you know from a charging infrastructure operator point of view, uh, if if my competition is that somebody is actually offering it for free, then adoption for my solution becomes a little more difficult. So that that's another challenge from a charging infrastructure point of view. When it comes to charging behavior, uh, you know, this is an example of how people charge from their house. Uh, they use this connector and uh, they just park it, park an e-rickshaw in front of their house and uh, charge it during the night. And uh, mostly some of them use free electricity connection. Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's one way of doing. Another way of charging uh, is basically uh, through, uh, you know, you can say this is an external charging or public charging, uh, uh, public charging system uh, where uh, most of these e-rickshaws are parked in an open area uh, and they are offered electricity connection or charging points and uh, they're charged some 50 to 70 rupees depending on the region and uh, you know who the how the relationship between the driver and the customer is. And I like uh, where you watch. Sorry? I like this picture very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the reality. We've been there. We've we've studied this market and found that this is the reality. So they, they don't even put uh, you know people to 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 monitor it. They have put CCTV cameras if you see on the right extreme right, they use some technology to reduce their operational cost. So once you put a CCTV camera, you, you can just monitor how much these vehicle, how much these vehicles are being charged and uh, theft is also avoided. So uh, that, that's how, you know, e-rickshaws are being charged. So, and, and when it comes to auto rickshaws, uh, obviously there are, I think very, very less or, or negligible fleet size of electric auto rickshaws. So we don't have more insights on how electric auto rickshaws are being charged but most of these e-rickshaws are, are charged in these way, this, this way. So that, that's how the reality is. So in terms of charging infrastructure for electric three-wheelers, we believe, uh, you know, when it comes to range, so, and when it comes to passenger transport, so if an auto rickshaw, electric rickshaw, uh, an e-rickshaw or an e-auto, uh, you know, if, if they do more than, if they do up to 60 kilometers per day, uh, which we call it as medium usage and if they have reasonably predictable routes uh, with regular AC charging uh, you know the costs can be easily managed and, and a value proposition can be created so I'm talking about an e-rickshaw or an auto rickshaw uh, which is using a lithium ion battery I'm, now I'm saying given lead acid uh, batteries while they are there but uh, the new generation of uh, e-rickshaws and auto rickshaws, electric auto rickshaws, which are coming now are looking at lithium ion batteries. The challenge has always been the cost and, uh, uh, and, and the range. So if you look at, uh, if the range is below 60, uh, the, you know, the cost of an electric auto rickshaw or an e-rickshaw can be, can be reasonably low. And with the regular AC charging, this commute can be managed. When it comes to you know passenger and goods transport, uh, you know where, where routes are unpredictable, like contract carriage, an auto rickshaw guy doesn't know where he wants, you know where he's going, and if he wants to cover more distance, you know in certain cities they go as high as uh, 150 kilometers because uh, uh, what I believe the national average for auto rickshaws in cities is 110 kilometers per day, uh, you know considering the top. Uh, seven or eight cities which are like top four metros and uh, the cities like Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, etc. So uh, in such applications, if you want to, uh, you know, offer uh, charging, uh, basically that, that may be a, a very, very expensive case. And uh, the cost of, because you have to put provision for a larger battery, uh, the cost may go very high and uh, we believe to keep the cost down 
uh, you know swapping can help uh, you know cater to this segment and from the oems perspective if you look at uh, you know cities like you know in bangalore where they do 100 plus kilometers when it comes to cities like nagpur they do around 60 to 80 kilometers per day so for for an oem who wants to design an electric auto rickshaw uh, for for any city in india uh, if he designs an auto rickshaw with a 120 kilometer range ba battery pack it will be a, a suitable pack for Bangalore, but would, would be an overkill for Nagpur. And if he does a 60 kilometer pack, it would be suitable for Nagpur, but but you know might require some inter uh, you know opportunity charge or some more charging during the day, which which is again inconvenient. So we believe uh, you know using battery swapping where uh, batteries can be swapped in in few minutes and uh, where if you separate the batteries from the vehicle cost. The vehicle cost at reasonable volumes will be lower than the the regular auto rickshaw or regular e-rickshaw and uh, the cost of battery plus energy plus infrastructure together can be uh, offered as a service and and the cost per kilometer of that service would be similar or lower than the cost per kilometer they are getting charged for uh, you know refueling either diesel petrol or or lpg so that that's how uh, that's what uh, we believe uh, basis our initial analysis and basis this analysis and understanding we have developed a, a solution uh, for uh, electric uh, all all sorts of electric two wheelers uh, we have tried to create a solution that works uh, across three wheelers and two wheelers and even micro trucks so that it becomes interoperable and with with economies of scale and uh, you know the cost can be brought down so i'll just play a quick video to show how this solution works and uh, let me just start it so if you look at this video this is a, a battery swapping kiosk which is like an atm machine which has all the batteries we offer users with an app which finds out where the nearest swapping station is and you know various types of vehicles as, as this video shows an e-rickshaw, an auto rickshaw and a bike they all use same batteries, same stations and with a the card they, they can open the uh, dock at the station these are the, the batteries, we call them smart batteries, swappable batteries and they are, they are being charged so the station understands, analyzes the battery as per that does the payment and you know they offer a fresh pack which user can put that back into the vehicle and the entire process you know just takes 30 seconds for one battery so if if, if uh, you know a user has uh, two batteries or three batteries it's gonna take not more than two minutes so the idea is how do we create a solution um, which is interoperable which is which is which enables user uh, you know to to behave exactly in the way he has been behaving and and we believe uh, this solution can uh, you know without altering their regular, regular behavior and uh, without altering their uh, spending habits in terms of the amount of money they spend on vehicle as well as energy this this model can actually replicate their behavior and offer them a solution which is 100% electric, which is 100% green and sustainable. And in, in this image, if you see, we have also shown a a, a shade which basically uh, is made up of solar, a roof. So we can integrate solar into it and make it 100% green because Indian grid, as as people call it, is very dirty and fired by coal. But uh, you can always integrate renewable energy, and when you integrate renewable energy to mobility. The, the payback for renewable energy increases tremendously and uh, uh, I mean it becomes much faster and uh, at the same time uh, the overall impact on emission reduction is also very high. So this is the, the solution uh, that we believe uh, we, you know we through battery swapping we can actually uh, transform uh, the way people are looking at electricity electrics especially in two wheelers and three wheeler space 
now in terms of the key elements of of this uh, first element is, is the battery uh, basically we call it smart battery in our case and uh, you know this is an uh, extremely small and lightweight battery uh, which is very very robust and swappable which allows people uh, you know we understand the usage of uh, an auto rickshaw driver or an e-rickshaw driver who might be a little you know rough or uh, i would say because of their awareness about the using the systems they might be they need solutions which are tamper proof which are robust this battery is also connected um, uh, at all times uh, we have a, 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 a sim card in it which connects to our servers at all times keeps us updated on the health of the battery it's interoperable as i've shown you uh, it works uh, you know for a two wheeler a three wheeler micro truck can be configured and can be put in, in and you know the same vehicle can be customized uh, for different applications. For example, in Nagpur, uh, an auto rickshaw can use one battery pack and swap once a day. And in Bangalore, an auto rickshaw can use two battery packs and swap once a day. So uh, that way, uh, it offers you customization and uh, uh, basically the application. Another way of looking at it is, uh, you know, this battery pack in, in a two-wheeler. So one battery pack can be used for a personal two-wheeler user uh, who can do 30 to 40 kilometers whereas uh, and a, a delivery boy uh, for e-commerce delivery might want to use two battery packs so uh, these these this offers enough flexibility for oems to play and create uh, platforms using the same investment and create platforms for different applications we have also built in a lot of intelligence uh, in this. There are there, there are uh, chips, um, uh, microcomputers, which basically helps us to take uh, to take stock of the health, understand uh, and process some data inside, and take decisions on how the battery has been performing. It's upgradable uh, because uh, you know the technology is evolving. The battery cell technology is evolving. This pack today, uh, you know, packs around 1.5 kilowatt hour uh, uh, of energy. Tomorrow, as technology evolves, the same pack will will have say two kilowatt hour, and and as as the technology evolves, it can have different types of cells. So in lithium ion family, there are different chemistries that are being maintained. Um, uh, so we don't know how these technologies are evolving. So tomorrow, you might see uh, another you know, uh, another variant of lithium ion batteries which might come. So these batteries can take those type of cells as well. And they're modular, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier. When it comes to the interchange station, uh, the swapping station, uh, they are all modular. So we can put one, two or three station depending on the demand uh, in that area. And uh, in terms of, uh, again, they, they are intelligent and connected they process some data they always share the data with our central servers on the usage of the station as well as usage of batteries and who is using uh, the vehicle uh, i mean which vehicle has been is using the station they allow quick swap so as, as you have seen in the video it doesn't take more than 30 seconds to do the swap it's fairly simple and user intuitive process uh, that we have tried to create here their temperature control so this is an important part here uh, given we are uh, managing these batteries uh, in a temperature controlled environment we are able to get twice the life of the battery that other uh, you know other battery manufacturers are able to get from a fixed battery solution so imagine uh, you know when a when a user goes to the station he gets battery pre-cooled at 25 degrees celsius and he puts it into the auto rickshaw or a bike and, and then he drives around for four or five hours and then he comes back and swaps it so that's how we are managing the temperature um, uh, you know of the battery and allowing us to give more life in if you look at indian ambient temperature where 40 is a norm uh, in summers and uh, you have seen uh, there are experiences of the nagpur uh, ev pilot where where the range had reduced literally to half and uh, you know the drivers have returned the vehicles 
so uh, that is what we have, we have taken into consider consideration when it takes to installation so this entire station can be installed in a day uh, it's a plug and play solution you can just need a power connection to plug in that, nothing else also when it comes to compatibility it is com compatible with multiple platforms works across uh, two wheelers three wheelers and micro trucks thus allowing uh, allowing us to grow our network uh, uh, to different places use different platforms and thus offer a competitive rate uh, throughout uh, the third part the third piece of that solution is smart network that we have built uh, is the back-end cloud system that connects batteries and stations and vehicles together it has a bunch of analytics which uh, Goldie was speaking about uh, that we these these are the things that we have built to help our partners uh, you know come along uh, and and enable them to focus on their core rather than some of the other aspects which which they are required to do because no one else is doing so this this allows us to do a daily customer connect uh, every time the battery goes into the network uh, you know uh, we know it uh, it allows us to offer real time optimization we understand from our partners where the vehicles are running basis that we optimize the network of these swapping stations uh, around the city we have a visualization tool which visualizes city based on the traffic demand, based on the inputs from our fleet partners and this is the same we set up the network. And over time as demand changes, as traffic pattern changes, we can remove the station and put it to some other route depending on, on, the, on the demand. It also allows us to connect uh, to uh, integrate payments, uh, you know, uh, where payments can be made digitally. Uh, you might have always heard this uh, issue where, you know, when you say, uh, I want to book a Ola ride, and if I, I say I'm paying by Ola money, they just refuse to take a ride because they are paying for their energy in rupees, whereas they cannot take money in Ola money. Uh, so we're trying to integrate that piece too, given, uh, you know, how they are anyways taking money in digital form. How do we use the same digital form, enabling them to pay it, uh, you know, for energy? So uh, that's what is another piece of it. And, and fourth is the fleet management, of course, where uh, we enable fleet operators to manage their fleets given all the batteries can be tracked and that's how vehicles can be tracked. And, uh, you know, bunch of parameters on how fleets are operating in certain areas and their usage pattern basis that optimization can be done. And with, with, with such, uh, such, data uh, data based approach we can use very few station locations and serve large city with high route coverage because here exactly you know, know where the demand is and it's unlike the regular fuel station network which has been which has evolved over last 100 years and mostly in the last few years it has been if you have land i you know you come with me it doesn't find out where the land is and you know does it serve the purpose so just we'll take you uh, through our, our app that we are building for the user for, for an auto rickshaw, e-rickshaw or a driver who, who would use our solution where he gets to know what is the state of charge of his battery, you know, how many kilometers he can do, what is his current speed. Uh, apart from this, uh, you know, he also is able to find out where the nearest swapping station is and whether he's able to make a two-way trip uh, from his current location to that swapping station or not, whether he's able to make a one-way trip, at least go there and, and top, top it up with the current charge that he has in his battery. So uh, that's an indicator. Uh, third is the energy consumption statistics, you know, how much energy he has been consuming, what is the mileage he's been getting, how much money he has in his wallet, and, uh, you know, a complete history of how much he has been paying uh you know on in terms of the energy so, so there's a very very simple uh, user app which has basic functionality and can be integrated with uh, the you know some of these data parameters can be offered to our fleet partners who can look at it in uh, and, and enable, put them in their system when it comes to the smart network so we have a command and control center one place from where we can monitor all the swapping stations and all the batteries uh, you know across the across the world and it gives us a, a bird's eye view of how our network has been how vehicles have been doing batteries have been doing how many kilometers 
uh, have been have been they have been running etc so when when you click on any of these stations it gives you a zoomed view of you know what is the state of charge of the docks so how many docks are there in the station docks are basically holders for batteries and how many batteries are there uh, in in these docks what is the state of charge of each of these batteries how much energy has been dispensed which type of vehicles have been using it so that gives us a, a fairly uh, bird's eye view of what's happening in that uh, you know in that operation and how do we optimize it for reducing the cost increasing the uh, you know efficiency in the system again when it click when you click on the batteries we see we get to see how the battery has been performing over the last 7 days how many kilometers that it has run on a daily basis how many how much it has been active you know how how active it has been over few last few years and how much power it has consumed what is the mileage it has been getting etc so that's that's basically uh, the the network that powers the solution now i'm just going into uh, the nitty gritties and you know how we believe cost economics have been working uh, we've just taken a, a total cost of ownership uh, you know for a, for an auto rickshaw um, compared it with given cng seems to be the most uh, cost effective uh, solution we just compared it with an electric auto rickshaw and, and we've considered both the cases with claim one subsidies uh, you know with with and without subsidies so if you look hey, at the rahul here yeah hi rahul hi uh, yuvraj uh, can you kind of wrap it up uh, soon sure sure i'll just quickly run this through so this basically okay. shows that uh, uh, you know uh, you know first of all there is a high upfront cost because electric vehicles are costlier than cng thing and after that the cost of operations is low so it comes closer to the blue the red curve comes closer to the blue curve and uh, but then there is a step up because uh, if you see here basically you have to replace the battery after 3 years and again so that's how the cost uh, without subsidies is is always higher and that is what we have been seeing so electric auto rickshaws have been there in the country but they never got a got a good response without subsidies when it comes to the subsidy case uh oops let me just uh, Let me go back to my product presentation. You have to return your uh, uh, control bar, Yeah, I'm just trying to uncheck it. Let me just return this control. Are you able to see my screen again? Yes, uh, Yuvraj. Sorry about this glitch. So, when it comes to with subsidy, uh, yes, because the initial cost reduces. So, uh, you know, you see that uh, basically electric auto is is still slightly more expensive um, uh, even after subsidies, but the overall cost comes down because of operation, but by the time it comes down you see here uh, there is again a step up because of replacement battery so that has been the challenge so far with electric auto the hence we did not see uh, an you know an uptake here so it breaks even at at, at fourth year which which basically is a longer time and that's why adoption of these is very low when it comes to swapping now uh, if you we have compared it with a you know Uh, an electric auto rickshaw with fixed battery versus a CNG auto rickshaw and electric auto rickshaw with swappable battery. If you see, because the initial cost of ownership of vehicle without batteries is very low, even lower than CNG, lower than you know electric vehicle with fixed battery. That's an that's a 
you know that is how you are reducing the barrier to entry and allowing people to you know look at option which is cheaper than the existing option in the market and you know there's no repeat payment of battery replacement and uh, you know break even is is happening from day one because right from the beginning you are low at your overall cost of purchase of the vehicle and then again the cost of usage of energy services is also lower than the cost of cng per kilometer so that that's the benefit of swapping we believe it's it offers you lower upfront cost uh, you know it also because uh, batteries and chargers are excluded from the package the refueling cost is also very low given it takes few minutes and practically the vehicle can be used 24 by 7 we have seen people using same auto rickshaw and two shift to earn more money so that is possible even with electrics if if battery swapping is off, off, offered and technology risk is not there given battery technology has been changing imagine a, an auto rickshaw driver buys a battery after three years he says oh what you have bought was a different thing now change technology has changed so he might feel ripped off so you know here there is an usage fee tomorrow if he wants to opt out he can opt out of the system but uh, he's paying only for what he has been using so the cost or uh, the technology risk has been reduced in this case now when it comes to standardization uh, there have been discussions on uh, you know that we need to for, for battery swapping there needs to be standard and and that is very important to achieve scale so that there is interoperability and there are many players who would want to enter into this space of our batteries as a service and the key parameters that needs to be standardized are the capacity of the battery the form factor connector and communication protocol and the internal technology can be completely open and this is just uh, so there has been an industry group formed uh, informally and has been have been discussing among themselves uh, on what are the possibilities of uh, you know using a same same type of battery and these are some of the specs that they, they have looked at where uh, you know batteries should not be weighing more than 14 kg should be of this size around 1.5 kilowatt hour so that's that's what uh, bluetooth for communication and can for communication between the battery pack and the vehicle so these are some of the basic uh, things that they want it to be standardized and uh, we believe that's the way if industry should if if industry come together comes together and takes just like petrol like petrol all the oems have accepted as a standard Reef, you know, standard fuel for their vehicles. They have petrol and diesel. They don't take kerosene. So, in, in the same way, you know, they have to come together in some way. And given this is slightly different animal, so uh, they still need to come together and uh, create a standard which works and let everyone compete amongst amongst one another. So there was another point on financing, which I'm trying to bring out. What are the challenges? You know, given they have limited credit history, auto rickshaw drivers have have challenges in getting securing credit. Uh, uh, the demand is uncertain, so they don't know about their revenues, and that's why they never get loans. Uh, but when it comes to electrics, the concerns are far more because technology is new. Bankers would have a little apprehensive. They have some unpleasant past experience with the unorganized e-rickshaw market, where you know. the drivers would not know when the battery is going to die and then they, they have to literally abandon their e-rickshaw and stop paying for their money lenders so the new banking system for those guys is the money lenders who charge them premium of 24 36% yeah i'm just just done in a minute so this, yeah uh, great that is very actually yeah. there are questions around financing yuvraj so we can cover the this part sure. uh, just give me one minute exactly 60 seconds to close on this right and uh, we believe with technology with data and analytics uh, bankers can be educated and that's how you can reduce their financing risk when players come together the fleet operator the energy solution provider and the vehicle oem together they can create solutions in the beginning uh, uh, which which can give comfort to the bankers to reduce the financing cost when it comes to innovation this is my last slide and um you know there are other applications apart from the first and last mile connectivity of uh, use at metro stations or bus stops uh, like e-commerce delivery where volumes are high weights are low time time it's not very time critical and routes can be planned e you know e-rickshaws or e-autos can be a, a suitable option second is waste collection uh, in cities where again routes are fixed not a very time critical operation um 
uh, these vehicles can be adopted. They are being piloted in certain cities, uh, shop on wheels, uh, given they have to stand in certain areas, but they don't need much speed or, or range. So that's another application. Tourism, of course, uh, historical and ecological uh, places anyways have a challenge of pollution and they have concerns around how these buildings are getting, uh, you know, is Im impacted by pollution. So that's where these uh, vehicles can be used. And fifth is, of course, advertisement, you know, how advertisement can give them some additional revenue and uh, these vehicles can, the, the financial gap can be bridged. So that that's about it. Uh, I think I have tried to cover all the points that were mentioned uh, uh, under my part. And uh, yeah, I'm open for any questions, if any. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Yuvraj. Uh, I must actually thank uh, both you and Goldie. In fact, the extent of content and the insights that you have shared uh, leaves uh, uh, not much things for consultants like P Manifold and me to do, Yuvraj and Goldie. <laughs> but I'm glad. Uh, thank you for uh, wonderful comments. Uh, Goldie, I know you have to rush. Uh, uh, can we use your 10 minutes to kind of uh, take upon some of very interesting questions that have come for you, Goldie? Uh, sure, Ram, sure. Great. Uh, so, Goldie, first question is like uh, uh, audience is uh, trying interested in understanding like in real life, uh, it, almost three years we have been operating. So what kind of problems, I know that lithium ion batteries is still a new uh, learning for you, but any kind of challenges uh, that you want to, uh, that you recollect are very important for the OEM industry, for the vehicle manufacturer, for the battery guys, for the charging guys to really solve so that uh, fleet uh, aggregator like you and the customer's convenience remains on high priority. Sure, I think there are two critical pieces. One is a vehicle, the other is a battery. You know, I think vehicle, as you guys also mentioned, I mean, this this was a you know literally a cottage industry, so to speak, right? Where people would import uh, CKDs from China in container loads and assemble in the warehouses and basement godowns of Korolba in Delhi. Um, and from there, we have come a long way. But uh, I think we still have a long way to go from an entire supply chain perspective, right? And, and we have uh, literally gone down at the vehicle level, looking at every single component. I think uh, as a country, uh, a lot is still desired from a supply chain now, whether it is around the power train, whether it is around the electronics, around some of the mechanical uh, you know, components. Uh, I, a lot of OEMs come and talk to me, a lot of uh, electric three-wheeler OEMs come and talk to me about how they have this great product. Uh, Fact of the matter is that most of the OEMs that are even in country today still rely heavily on Chinese imports for their supply chain uh, with not that degree of confidence uh, in, in terms of the product performance uh, like you would say today see in a typical Bajaj or a PRG or a TBS uh, CNG, right, three-wheeler. So I think that's the one big piece on the uh, on the vehicle platform itself. So as a, as a company, we're investing a lot in terms of identifying the specs and the build of how the next generation vehicle platforms should look like. Um, on the energy side, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I still remember the days then, uh, back in 2015, when we used to actually keep uh, jerry cans of distilled water at our hubs to fill up a battery every uh, week or so. Uh, and then we moved on to different battery types like VRLA, and then uh, eventually moving on to sort of, um, uh, you know, lithium ion. I mean, from a driver's perspective, please be aware that you know driver does not take a joy in you know topping up the water in his batteries or you know doing voltage checks or doing gravity checks, right? And what a driver truly needs is an absolutely non-intrusive uh, range, right? Much like he expects from a CNG, he goes to the fuel station or or a petrol station, you know, fills up, waits for 10 minutes, fills up his tank, and is good to go. You know, he's not checking every day whether the uh, you know fuel is performing at the right level or not right so uh, similarly i think uh, the, the battery industry also needs to come to terms with it i still again see a lot of players who still promulgate flooded batteries and then will do topping every 15 days i think we will need to move away from that mindset i mean that you know that is not going to help for this industry it may help some companies in the short term but long term you need to have a solution both on a vehicle platform also on the energy 
which is absolutely idiot proof gives a similar kind of experience that drivers are used to from a traditional three wheeler perspective i hope that answers the question yeah yeah definitely uh, goldie another thing goldie like uh, another interesting question like uh, can you give some very top numbers like you said you have four hubs uh, almost 800 vehicles so would it kind of mean that 200 vehicles uh, are getting almost uh, two times charged in a hub so how are you kind of scheduling and maintaining this kind of a uh, volume yeah so yeah it is a very operationally intensive business uh, you know which is where uh, our, our supply chain partners play a critical role do understand that we work with players like Hangatech, like Amron, like Goenka as literally strategic partners and not as a procurement partner. And uh, between our organizations, there are very clearly defined SOPs, there are clearly defined uh, SLAs, uh, and there are very stringent penalties by the way, right? Which means, uh, you know, if you need to do things in a certain manner, it needs to be done in a certain manner, right? So yes, it is a very operationally intensive business, but something that we built a lot of excellence over the years, right? So today, you know, we have a very clear, uh, SOP is that each of our hubs in terms of when the vehicles need to be charged, when they need to be taken off, um, the records maintained, GPS logs, uh, health checks, uh, preventive maintenance. So everything is done in a very, very systematic process oriented manner, um, which we believe is uh, it continues to be the need of the art because it's a very, very fledgling industry right now. And, um, you know, uh, it needs uh, the right intervention on a regular basis. So. So yes, it is operational intensive, intensive, but I think uh, we've kind of managed the code around it. Okay, great. Uh, and any advice uh, you have, Goldie, like this model has to go through multiple cities. What kind of support? Uh, I think uh, Yuvraj also brought the issues about uh, permits, uh, uh, the political nature around it. Uh, the corporate ownerships, uh, I think, are uh, restricted. Uh, in many of the states uh, on this uh, vehicle segment. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, permits uh, and corporate ownership, what has been your experience and what kind of a support from policy side do you think the city and the state should kind of come to really kind of uh, support the shared uh, electric uh, three-wheeler uh, mobility? So, well, I think, uh, you know, from a policy perspective, we have seen the entire spectrum when there was no policy to now at least more than half a dozen states having a fairly robust EV policy in place. And I believe uh, those states will continue to leave the charge. Uh, I mean, whether you talk of Maharashtra, whether you talk of um, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana is going to be policy in, in exactly a week from now. Uh, and each of the policy documents that you see at a state level are very, very encouraging, right? You take Andhra Pradesh, for example, it is doing away with both permits as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, the corporate ownership restrictions on electric vehicles, especially three wheelers. So I think, uh, you know, progressive states will take a lead and will show the path for the rest of the country, much like if you, I don't know if you're aware or not, but back in 2014, early 2015, Delhi was the only state that actually had an e rickshaw policy in place, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of other state governments actually copy pasted that policy. Okay, good or bad, I can't say, but you know, I think uh, we we have uh, you know good states uh, today that are leading um, the the the, uh, the direction and I'm I'm pretty confident that working closely with the government and showing them the merits, um, you know we'll be able to have a much more favorable policy in the times to come. Don't say challenge to that. One very interesting question for you, Gordon, is uh, kind because you talked about uh, the challenges with drivers' engagement and also mm -hmm. one of the. The question is basically uh, uh, with the kind of drivers requirement and uh, the kind of uh, uh, numbers you suggested 18 to 20,000 per month. Uh, would the kind of, because there is a lot of frustration with the Ola and Uber kind of drivers with the current changes in uh, their engagement. So are you seeing like uh, drivers from four wheelers kind of migrating to uh, three wheelers and that kind of helping uh, fill that space and the need that uh, uh, this segment would have would need. So I think economically, yes, uh, there are a lot of use cases where it makes a lot of sense. I can, I mean, I have personal examples of some of my own personal drivers and friends drivers having left and actually moved on to Smarty because they, they realized they're making more money. 
Uh, I don't think it's a question so much of an economic viability of switching over from being an all over driver to driving three wheelers. I think uh, the, the bigger issue really is uh, social nature in terms of the status and the, the comfort of driving a four wheeler uh, in an air conditioning in the cool cab, right, versus driving a three wheeler. So I think there's a lot of, I would say, uh, psychological barriers to it, right? I mean, honestly, even the fact that you call an e rickshaw an e rickshaw. Um, uh, you know, uh, prevents many people from joining the phrase because in their mind uh, they think it's a it's a lowly paying kind of a job, right? But what I can tell you is that, and we have people who have left their jobs at Flipkart. I have people who have left their jobs at BPO and call centers who are driving for us, all right? And so uh, I think once people uh, you know start seeing the real value, and by the way, the money that the drivers make is not because we are burning cash. And yeah, man, there's a bona fide demand fulfillment that they're doing, which allows them to make that kind of money. Uh, you know, and I think once that message uh, starts spreading far and wide, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that more and more people would want to enter into the trade. Okay, great, Goldie. You have uh, time for another question, or you have to leave, Goldie? I, we have hold you for longer. I can take exactly one more question, and I have a hard stop at 5:45 now. So, uh, okay, exactly one last more. question. Uh, Goldie, like uh, that's about the uh, 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 some numbers. Goldie, you talked about the demand and potential opportunity. Uh, and given a metro, you kind of suggested like 10%, less than 10% of a uh, passenger, those are commuting in metro, are currently kind of using uh, uh, such shared uh, services. How How do you see? With the road congestion, with the parking limitations, uh, I think the phasing out of current IC will not happen immediately. So, is there enough real estate available to accommodate uh, the new electric three-wheeler and kind of gradually lead phase for the transition of the existing IC vehicles? Exactly, and that's where you know, as a company, we've been so we're very acutely aware of that while trying to solve the mobility problem, you cannot create a monster in terms of traffic congestion, right? So we're acutely aware of it. And that is why from day one, we decided that it will be a very purely shared mobility, right? Unlike in a CNG auto where generally one person goes at a time, our vehicles moves four people at a time. So from an evacuation perspective, we are actually decongesting, right? Uh, by a ratio of four, which means if one auto can move one person at a time, our vehicles move four people at a time. And so in that sense, we believe at least our business model augurs very well uh, to address the uh, congestion problem. But to your point, yes, it's valid uh, that we can't keep mindlessly adding more electric three-wheelers while not replacing the existing stock. You know, in my sense is that every year about 10% of the electric three-wheeler, any which is given the shelf life is about five or six years, at least 10 to 15% are coming up for refresh. And which is where I think there's a clear opportunity for that refresh to happen through an electric three-wheeler, right? And that's the opportunity that we are uh, banking on. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Goldie. Uh, my next question uh, is uh, for you, Yuvraj. Yeah. Uh, 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 I think the uh, audience is kind of interested in understanding. Uh, I think you did mention about uh, battery life advantage uh, with the swapping. Right. Uh, any numbers from real life uh, that you kind of believe are possible in case of e auto example that you gave can you cite some example like for a typical e auto what kind of a kwh battery we are kind of talking uh, would similar uh, 1.5 kwh into two batteries would be sufficient or it would need kind of a three batteries See, uh, what we believe, um, actually, the solution that is offered is for two and three, uh, you know, it can be put in either two packs or three packs or even one pack. Uh, what we believe is, uh, depending on the, the usage and the route pattern, if the user is able to find a swapping station within 30 kilometers, within the, the trip of 30 kilometers, then he just needs one pack. If he thinks that you know after 60 kilometers I'm comfortable to refuel, then he'll need two packs. If the user says no, I need 100 kilometers before what I want to go to any refueling station, then mm -hmm. in that case we would want to offer them three packs. So there is always a trade-off uh, when it comes to pricing. You know, usually if you offer bigger packs 
obviously the cost will be high similarly three packs the pricing will be different versus somebody using two pack and swapping once a time once a day so it, it would be a trade off uh, you know we are doing these uh, experiments uh, in our initial pilots and we are trying to get insights from users on what would be their comfort level in terms of using one pack or two pack so and in an auto rickshaw uh, you know usually one pack will give them 30 to 35 kilometers of range two packs will give them 60 65 and with three packs they can go up to all the way up to 100 so uh, you know depending on how comfortable they are to swap once a day twice a day we will you know offer them this solution okay and uh, does that mean that uh, you will always necessarily use only one battery at a time or there will be some uh, common thing that you will be pulling between the two batteries uh i am not sure exactly uh, what the question is i'm I, if if i understand you're talking about whether yeah in this to understand like would you always discharge using only one battery at a time and only when that battery goes off its limit then you will go to the second battery or no it won't happen then? that way so the way it works is uh, when if you put two battery packs in an auto rickshaw electric auto rickshaw for an auto rickshaw it is a single battery system and both the battery packs will be discharged together so the okay. end percentage it says 20% charge left the 20% is actually left in both the batteries okay so okay. that's how the usage will be so okay. usually what will happen is uh, both battery packs will have their own bms one bms will take over the uh, will take over and become a master bms and the other will become slave for the user for the end uh, for the vehicle it is a single battery system okay okay and the twice the battery life uh, advantage that you said uh, uh, swapping can be in terms of number of cycles uh, would you have any number like i think you shared uh, uh, standard spec uh, what cycles were it talking so usually uh, you know anything about 2500 cycles is what is expected uh, you know battery life out of these batteries and we are trying to push that limit to go as long as 4000 cycles and and trying to see you know how we can by managing them thermally by you know the bms managing it for all for its performance and usage how do we stretch the life of battery to as high as 4000 cycles so yeah. that that's where uh, the uh, technology piece is coming into play where how do you manage the battery cells together okay so the current chemistry is nmc or any other chemistry that you are we are trying out a couple of chemistries uh, unfortunately i'm not in a position to share the, the details more details but uh, both are under the lithium ion family and we are looking at uh, experimenting with two three chemistries and trying to understand how these are performing in different uh, ambient as well as operating conditions okay great yeah uh, there is a question on uh, the, i think you haven't spoken about it but i think yeah. the uh, one of them is kind of interesting in understanding the battery second life uh, there is lot being talked about battery recycling uh, right. would you have some uh, insights into sure. the auto condition when would you think uh, the battery is kind of not useful for to be used in e auto when it can go to the second life use uh, right so, if you can share any so, thoughts yes basically uh, we are looking at full life cycle of the battery and uh, the first application of course is the automotive application after its life in automotive application that means typically when the battery capacity comes down to anywhere between 75 to 80% that's when mm -hmm. people usually phase out the battery from automotive application and put into an energy storage application that is the second life of battery so we okay. at sun mobility uh, you know we are basically our parent company sun sun new energy systems which comes from the sun group they are already into renewable energy and looking at how energy storage systems can be created using batteries that have been phased out from the automotive applications and uh, these batteries still have 75% or 80% of the life in them and after their usage in energy uh, storage applications for another whatever 2 3000 cycles or maybe 4000 cycles 
and after that uh, the battery can be recycled so there are a few battery uh, you know battery recyclers i mean there's i guess one right now in india which does lithium ion battery recycling so they will extract close to 95% of all the important materials and uh, reuse them and uh, you reuse them into a new lithium ion battery pack so we are looking at full end to end life and that's how by by that is the reason why sun mobility wants to own the batteries and manage them so that the entire life of these batteries can be managed and maximum juice can be taken out and that can be passed on to the initial customer which is the automotive customer interesting very interesting very nice uh, yeah. two more questions one uh, 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 just a second so i can read some of the chat thing I, if i can answer one of the questions which says what about the security of these swappable batteries regarding the theft uh, if if may i take the liberty to answer this directly rahul yeah, yeah please go ahead uh, uh, yeah Raj. so the batteries that we have designed um, uh, we have given they are trackable at all point of time they have a gps chipset which allows us to track them second it also has a gprs sim which through network operator can be tracked easily another thing that we are adding is a bunch of locking technologies which doesn't allow the batteries to get mechanically unlocked until and unless there is a uh, there is a communication that has happened so we have filed a patent around this technology which allows the batteries to be mechanically removed from the vehicle only when they are in the you know close uh, proximity of the station because that's how it, uh, it understands that the vehicle has come to to the station so we have added the, those bunch of uh, technologies to safeguard the theft of these batteries but uh, you know just to give you an example in india you not just in india you know theft of things uh, the only solution for uh, for that is insurance and that's how all the given ola then uber they are also offering vehicles on lease they all rely on the same thing while they will add tracking devices and stuff but at the end the end out the end thing is if you insure it okay that's part of the cost and that's how you safeguard your systems against theft okay great yeah uh, this question is talking about so like let's say there are two operators uh uh yuvraj yeah. one is let's say mobility and let's say another is company x uh, yeah they both into uh similar swapping business let's call them right. energy operators yeah both of them are following the standard specs for the battery which you right. kind of in which uh, the committee uh, under dr ashok gundurwala chetan and other team kind of uh, made it uh, right so here uh, will there be physical uh, distinctness between these two batteries in any form that the user Uh, cannot interchange, or it will be only software kind of uh, thing that will uh, uh, distinguish these two batteries. Basically, so when it comes, yeah, things are possible. No, so when it comes to stand, you know, uh, um, standardization, there are basics that uh, that you know every OEM will or every battery manufacturer will be required to follow. Those standard things will be the shape, the size. the capacity connector as well as the communication protocol now right. beyond that that's where companies will try to differentiate that's how that will that's how sun mobility will try to differentiate itself from uh, any other company and we are building our own software network and we are uh, you know uh, putting a bms inside but the other company may not want to do that so when it comes to similarities only these four things will be similar after that it's beyond you know it's up to the company's imagination to add features and stuff to the batteries so okay. for the user the some, experience is okay the, uh, the the battery from other energy operator in case of yeah. emergency if it lands up into sun mobility station and if there is some additional pay charge that he is paying for using another energy operator so i'm saying ki by software that should be allowed right because all communication mm. and all those things remains the same no what i believe uh, you know in the beginning rahul uh, i'm talking about the next 2 to 3 years the way it will work at the uh, at the max is like mobile phone uh, you know sim cards 
so once you have opted in in vodafone or an idea you okay. cannot you know if, if in that area there is no vodafone signal you are out of coverage you cannot okay. say that okay you know give me uh, an idea coverage and i will pay for that so it will be like that so one person will be subscribed i'll give you a use case you know in an oems automotive auto oems showroom there will be two three battery uh, suppliers sitting there at their desk and you know the user will buy any uh, say auto rickshaw from say bajaj uh, without batteries and then they will choose whether to choose sun mobility or xyz or abc and once they have opted for that plan until and unless they get out of the plan they are they are closely linked with it right so at the time of opting that and maybe after say after 6 months he did, doesn't like sun mobility services then he goes to xyz again to the showroom of bajaj or someone else and then mm -hmm. he changes from sun mobility to someone else so he returns the sun mobility assets you know and after that he goes to them and gets that subscription so it will work in in that way to begin with maybe later on there might be cases where in batteries would want to battery companies would want to offer interoperability uh, like how atms offer you know one atm can offer cash for other guys so that that is still i would say some some distance away for now to begin with it will be you know any vehicle and one battery supplier to begin with and until unless you find it it's the benefit he's getting is that he's only using for the amount of time and amount of uh, thing he has used the services for so he's just used for 3 months after 3 months he didn't doesn't like sun mobility services he returns back the battery and goes to some other provider but he so cannot change in between i think last question how many docks uh, to kind of expect from sun mobility in uh, next year pyuvraj uh, we we have uh, big plans to um, you know uh, for for cities uh, we have looked at several geographies we have you know signed up an mou with andhra pradesh state government where we are saying that we would want to uh, deploy our infrastructure uh to begin with we will do some controlled pilots with some of our partners in in one or two geographies where we'll okay. test the solution in real life and after that we are going to scale up and and uh, the scales will be in in the range of uh, you know few hundred stations in one city so that the entire city is covered one shot because in battery swapping it is it is very less gray it is more black and white that if you don't have enough coverage it will never take off and if you have once enough coverage it was it's going to be a win win for all okay so one station is kind of 15 docks right the diagram shows the picture yes. that you show one one station has 15 docks okay great i think with this uh, uh, i think uh, we would want to uh, say goodbye and uh, thank you to all our speakers both speakers goldie and yuvraj and also all our participants um, i think e3 wheeler is definitely a very very interesting space uh at the manipur we would be very very interested uh, and uh, like to support any of you who are inclined to really jump into this space and uh, take it forward yuvraj is kind of confirming ki lot of technology is in place uh so i think it is the industry is kind of ready uh, india is ready government with its policy sets are kind of uh, fairly ready i think now it's uh, players like uh, smarty sun mobility and you who have to really jump into the fray and uh, make it happen so welcome uh, and uh, look forward uh, friends our next topic we will be covering on uh, battery management systems design thermal management uh, the dates and other things will be conveyed uh, shortly to you so thank, thank you, you again thank you everyone thank you uh, yuvraj thank you others thank you organizers thank you yuvraj thank you thank you everyone
Hello. Yeah, I know. How are you? I'm supposed to call you message to us. Uh, no, in the chat box, comment so organizers and speakers kindly insight for the visionary. Mm hmm. Uh huh. That's up. ठीक है ना मैं अटेंड नहीं कर रहा रजिस्ट्रेशन डाल देता 